how you doing? This is Mike for Working Class Thoughts. So, today is going to be the Crossbell Ranch murders. Now, this is a huge murder, and it's still unsolved to this day. And while I'm saying that, let me also let you know it is actually still active. Now, he was, now the victim was killed on Crossbell Ranch in Osage County, Oklahoma. Now, this little community is actually by Bowering and Hula, and it's better known as Hula, but it's actually Whipperwell and Bowering. So, this is a huge murder, and by the end of this one, meaning the episode, I hope you actually understand why. Now, Eugene Claremont E.C. Molander III was actually born October 26, 1937. Now, we all have to understand Oklahoma in the 1970s and the 1980s. E.C. Molander was the heir to one of the largest cattle ranches in the whole state of Oklahoma. Now, E.C. Molander's father was, father's name was Eugene Claremont Molander Jr., his mother was Kathleen Boren Molander. And yes, he did have siblings. His sister, his sister's name was Katsy Molander. <clears throat> she married the owner of the New Orleans Saints. Yes, you did hear me right. The owner of the New Orleans Saints. Now, his name was John W. Malcolm or Meckham Jr. Now, let's look at the ranch as a whole. The family's ranch name was Crossbell Ranch. It covered roughly around 130, 600 acres in Osage County, Oklahoma. Now, Eugene was married at the time of his demise. Her name was Linda Vance Molander. Together, they actually had four children. Around 1960, Gene Molander handed full management to his son. Now, personally, I have heard he did not want to. In fact, the only reason why he did it was he had failing eyesight at the time. Now, you have to understand, if you know anything about farming and ranching, then you have to understand that eyesight is very crucial. You have to have great eyesight. So, once it started failing, he had to look at somebody to run a ranch. And in his mind, even though he didn't want to, he handed it over to his son. Now, so get this. His son somehow managed to run up a lot of debt. And when I say a lot, I'm talking in a tune of $12 million. Now, the main reason for this is stated mm -hmm. that E.C. and his wife, they lived a very lavish lifestyle. Now, eventually, his wife got fed up with all the debt and the financial troubles. So she moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now, with all their children, and at the time she stated that she wanted a divorce. Now, it was the night of September 26, 1970. E.C. Boulder III was brutally beaten and shot right between the eyeballs. Now, Chubb Anderson, his bodyguard, was actually shot in the shoulder. Police, basically, I would assume when they arrived at the scene, were like, this guy was being brutally beaten and shot and you were here at the house so what were you doing how did you not hear why didn't you help sooner so chubb anderson's explanation for the police was i was upstairs making a bath now by the time i actually heard any commotion and by the time i could get down to the pool house where he was at he had already been shot however he did claim to see two people fleeing the scene of the crime and when he returned fire at the two, one of them managed to graze his shoulder. At least that's what Chubb Anderson stated at the time. Now, I can honestly say, initially, the police did make a number of mistakes at the crime scene. One main mistake was actually disturbing the physical evidence before it could be properly gathered. Now, another major mistake was they moved the um, E.C. Molander III's body from the crime scene. They also embalmed the body before an autopsy could be comp uh, properly completed. Now, a lot of rumors around the community, they did not help the case whatsoever. Um, but the police did do an extensive investigation. Although, no one was actually officially charged with the murder. Now, looking in this case, it's really been kind of interesting. And the rumors alone that you will hear... 
they're fascinating enough. So the first possible motive, actually, was a large debt that was out on the ranch. And there was also a large claim on his life insurance policy. Now, a lot of locals claimed, and a lot of locals still do claim, that the mafia was somehow involved in his death. Now, reportedly, it was rumored that E.C. Molander III took out a loan with the mafia, and he could not pay it back. Now, police did look into his wife, naturally. I mean, we all know if you follow true crime that the spouse is always one of the people that the police always look at. So, I mean, after all, this one's a little bit more different for investigators. I mean, there is a $15 million life insurance policy out on them. Now, how much again was that? $15 million in the 70s. Now, at a later point, the family agreed to an $8 million settlement in 1971. Now, Linda Molander had filed against the insurance company. Now, I want everyone to understand around 1972, there was a bankruptcy plan in effect. Now, it was a plan to pay off any of the ranch's debts, and then they figured that they could just simply refinance the rest of the land. Now, this actually included a $5 million um, of assurance proceeds, and then they also sold off livestock, as well as a good portion of the ranch property that they had. Now, this next one kind of gets kind of interesting. So Gary, uh, Gary Glass, he was a private investigator. Now, he claimed in 2010, Chubb Anderson told him that he killed E.C. Molander in a fight after Chubb Anderson helped out the Osage County Sheriff's serve divorce papers on E.C. Molander III in the pool house. Now, Chubb Anderson claimed Lonnie Joe Brown, who was a ranch hand at the time, also, he was also Chubb Anderson's brother-in-law, actually helped him stage the murder. In fact, even shot him in the shoulder to make it more plausible. So, so their story would be some random people broke in and they killed E.C. Molander III. He even shot him in the arm or in the shoulder to actually make it look like it happened. Sadly, the world will actually never know. This is because Chev Anderson actually passed away later that same year in 2010. Out of Pahuska, 2010, two arrest warrants have been collecting uh, dust on the desk of the Osage County District Attorney's Office. Now, Rex Duncan... Now, keep in mind, both have been signed, they both have been notarized, even still, neither one has been properly filed, neither one has been executed by the Sheriff's Department. Now, everyone says both men will never be charged. Now, Duncan Chubb Anderson did confess to a Tulsa private investigator in 2010. Now, this is the reason that the warrants were initially filed. Lonnie Joe Brown was officially charged because Chubb Anderson said he helped stage it. Now, everyone realized that there is a three-year limitation on accessory to murder. Now, this means he cannot be charged or will be thrown out of court. Now, this part is actually kind of funny to me. I can almost see the facial expression on Duncan's face when he was sworn in as Osage County's district attorney two months after Chubb Anderson died. I mean, when he was asked by the media why nothing has been done about the murder, he simply stated, I had no idea why the warrants had never been filed properly and why they were never executed by the Osage County Sheriff's Office properly. And if he was alive today, I would charge him with first degree murder my first day in office. Now, you got to realize the law has changed, and I do realize that. I know, however, it didn't change fast enough for this case. See, there was a limitations on being charged as an accessory to murder in 1970 in the state of Oklahoma. This is when he was initially charged. Today, there's actually no limitations on when he could be charged. Now, Duncan reminds people that the case is still active to this day. Now, Brown is a person of interest. However, unless investigators learn that he was more involved in the case than initially, that, or more involved in the case more than what the police initially thought, it is unlikely that, no, that anyone will ever be charged with this murder. 
I mean, let's a little bit now. Let's spend a little bit to understand the Molander family as a whole. So, in 1893, the Cherokee Strip land was active in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, so, hold on one second. So, Ed Molander first staked his claim uh, Oklahoma land during that initial land run. Now, in the 1940s, train loads of their cattle was shipped to Kansas City Stockyard in the state of Kansas from their own railroad in Hula. That's right. You heard me right. Their own private railroad. That's how wealthy their ranch actually was and how big it was initially. I mean, they had their own freaking private railroad. Now, let's move on a little bit. Now, when they took the cattle to Kansas, they often all went as a family. They would stay in the Mula Block Hotel. This is where all the celebrities at the time stayed at. Now, when I say celebrities, I'm talking about in the tune of Babe Ruth, Frank Sinatra, Bob Hope, and yes, even the band The Beatles. Now, in the 1960s, hell, I mean, even the U.S. presidents even stayed there. I mean, Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Calvin Coolidge, and Herbert Hoover. The hotel actually had a nickname at one point as White House West. And this is because Kansas City or Kansas born Harry Truman actually stayed there so often. Now, when the Molander's land was auctioned off, it was the largest land auction in the state of Oklahoma history. In fact, I actually think it is still considered one of the largest that ever happened. Now, it happened actually on the Osage County Fairgrounds in Pahuska, Oklahoma. Now, some ranches were already sold off, and this included Burt Creek, Little Chief, Sedan Ranch EC. Some of their land was already taken. Molander Ranch is still considered one of the largest spreads in the state of Oklahoma. Now, Katzi Molander, Wittenberg, ran to, met, ran to ranch until she died in 2017. Now, Katzi was raised on the ranch. The lady even broke in buffalo. She had a name for her own buffalo name that she called uh, Geronimo that she actually broke in that she could ride whenever she wanted to. I mean, it was so tame that even kids were reportedly able to ride on it. At least that's what I heard. I don't know if it's true or not. Now, she met John Malcolm. They managed to have four children together. Now, she was very active in charities around the state of Oklahoma all around and all around Houston, Texas. Now, once her and John actually divorced, where is a girl to go? If you're Katzi Molander, you simply just go home. And she moved back to Crossbell Ranch. Now, she wanted to help her mother, Kathleen, or uh, Kathleen. This lasted until she met John, or Jim Wittenberg III. He was a rancher from Amarillo, Texas. Now, she simply calls him the love of her life, however, when she's asked about him. You know, like, some people have pet names, right? Like, some people, you know, you have, like, baby girl, uh, baby, my love, uh, my amour, you know, whatever. So, for her, it was, eh, he's the love of my life, which is actually kind of cool if you think about it. So, anyways, they spent the rest of their lives together happily. They traveled the world. They were actually very known to be very polite and extremely level-headed and very committed people. They touched so many people's and lives, in fact, it could not fit into a notebook and in their hometowns. The fact that Katzi was so passionate about the elder care in the Bartlesville, Oklahoma, over the years, Katzi started Elder Care's annual fundraiser. Katzi called it the good, the bad, and the barbecue. Now, they hosted events there at Crossbell Ranch with over 900 guests at a time. Now, people often say, Mike, rodeos are dead. You know, you could have been more wrong, however. Green Country Classic Ranch Rodeo is a really good one, actually, as an example. I did manage to find out one article about a couple that found a sell ad about the ranch after the murders. Now, a 130,000 acre ranch with four ranch houses, one large, three small, seven barns, 10 sheds, all with equipment to put on shoe horses, 
branding and tacking, as well as veterinarian medicine in all the shacks. All fencing was in excellent condition. For only $300,000, the article stated, you provide the cattle, you provide the horses, and you provide the TLC. Now, Jeb Willis showed the couple around the place. They said they were very misleading about the ranch's dark history, however. I mean, and why wouldn't they be? It sells after all, right? So anyways, once the wife realized what happened, they turned it down and bought a different ranch, however. Now, let me say this. Looking into this murder, ask around like I did, and you will hear so many different stories about cross Bell ranch murders. The Osage Indians, and you guessed it, Phyllis Oil. Now, a lot of people told me that the Molander Sr. stole the land from the Osage Indians for his ranch with the help of other wealthy businesses, oil light business people. That's actually what the native person that was part of the Osage Nation told me. So, one local Osage native, well, three actually, told me that Crossbell Ranch was going to end with bloodshed because he shed so much of their blood to get it. They said that their family's land and themselves were cursed by an Osage elder forever for stealing their land. Now, other locals told me that the Molanders did so much good for people and the towns and the city of Bartlesville. There's evidence and there is truth to it, however, that I found. When you're in Washington County and Osage County areas, you will quickly see there is a lot of history, good and bad, oil history, very big history, in, uh, very big history in cattle and farming, a interesting Native American history, the Osage Nation. The result is a lot of stories, rumors, true and false, good and bad blood. A whole lot of family secrets. Really, it has only been not that many years that a lot of the secrets are actually coming out. Now, let's keep in mind, now touching up a little bit, now let's keep that in mind and let's, touching up on Chubb Anderson. Now, he confessed to murder, right? Now, I want you to understand, and I believe he did it. I do believe that he actually did it. As a true crime listeners, we have to understand Chubb Anderson was known for his explosive temper. He told George Wayman, Osage County Sheriff, that he would take all the information he knows to the grave. And he died of natural causes of November 24, 2010, in Coffeyville, Kansas. He later told, he see, the reason why he said he was going to take it to the grave was he got so tired of being hounded if he did the murders. All right, so we got we to gotta understand that. Hold on one minute. All right. <clears throat> so we have to understand this, that when I was saying all that about the local area, you will find that. And I think that that's going to be true to any small town that anybody actually resides in. I mean, after all, anytime you have oil, lots of money in cattle, uh, Native American at the time, there was a lot of racial tension among Native Americans in the 1970s. I believe here on Working Class, we actually touched up on some of that in the Osage Murders episode. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is when I was doing research in this case, um, I found there's three different books. A lot of locals considered the first book completely bullshit. In fact, the statement that I heard when I asked about the first book that was written about the murders was the guy was from a different state and he didn't know anything about the murders and he didn't know anything about the area. He didn't know anything about the people. He didn't know anything about the case whatsoever. Now, then I heard that there was a book that was somewhat better than that one. And then I heard about Footprints in the Dew, where all the locals say that is the best book that's out there on this murder. And I can actually say it's a good book. And it's definitely worth a read if you're a true crime listener. I highly recommend Footprints in the Dew if you're looking into this murder. Now, when I was talking about Phillips Oil, the reason why I'm stating that is it's one of the biggest oil companies in the whole world. And if you're around the area of Osage and Washington County, you'll quickly realize that, I mean, they single-handedly help these towns build up. 
Now, the result of that was a lot of the local natives, they had a lot of problems with land disputes, okay? And you can understand this. So you have these people that's been here, and you have all these people coming in because they hear, they hear about all the oil, and they hear about all the cattle. So you have all these people coming in, and you have all these land disputes as a result. And a lot of these land disputes actually ended up quite violent. Now, another local, going in on this case a little bit more, another local actually told me, you know, Chubb Anderson did it. He stated that um, growing up, you know, he had talked to somebody who actually knew somebody who knew, you know, him kind of thing and stated. I mean, and this wasn't like a one-time thing. Normally, if I hear it one time, I'll be like, hey, it's a possibility that he did it because I heard this from blah, 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 blah. This is something I've heard repeatedly. And when I say repeatedly, I mean accurately, um, people not knowing each other really that well and all saying the exact same thing, that Chubb Anderson did it and no one will ever be charged with the crime because Chubb Anderson died. Mm -hmm. Now, I do want to state, like I did say, he did have a violent pen, uh, temper. I mean, he was known for that. He was also one of the, he was also known to be one of the best damn cowboys around the area, from what I understand. A lot of people told me old Chubb was one of the best ranch hands you'll ever see in your life. Now, I found that fascinating because when I looked at pictures of him, he wasn't that you know built up. When he was younger, he was just an average build guy. <coughs> but he was known to have an explosive temper. That's something I heard repeatedly, like over and over again. And then to answer a question before it gets uh, um, asked, why did I want to do this episode in the first place? Well, for a lot of reasons. Unlike serial killers, this local murder has a lot of fascinating details. When you're looking into it, you hear the rumor about the organized crime debt that uh, E.C. Molander III had. That's fascinating to me. Now, I don't believe it. I've heard it from multiple times from different people, though. So it's, it's, it's a possibility that's still out there. Um, you have the wife that's wanting to move to Tulsa and file for divorce with the kids. And you have the $15 million life insurance policy that was out on his life at the time. Now, you also have the land and so much debt accumulated on the land that they had no choice but to sell large portions of it. And on top of that, they still got money out of it. Now, I don't know if Chubb Anderson, per se, would have got money out of it. I don't know if his wife had Chubb killed him. I don't know that. I've heard that. I've actually heard that what actually happened. This is a story that I find most interesting. I'm not going to say who told it to me. But this interesting story, I mean, the way it was presented to me is just like if you're in a bar somewhere with somebody and you're having a smoke. I mean, let's be, let's be honest. That's basically what it's like. So... This guy proceeded to tell me that, really, the wife hired Chubb Anderson and Chubb Anderson's brother-in-law to take out E.C. Molander III so that she can get the business going on the ranch to get it back up and running. You know, pay off the debt, sell off the cattle, and then basically promise Chubb Anderson and the partner that they would get a cut of the money once it was settled out of court. Now, that's a story I heard about two or three times from different people, and as somebody who follows true crime a lot, when I'm going over the police's statements about the possible different motives, I honestly feel like that motive is the most plausible out of everything that I heard. I think that is the most plausible. And the other thing that I also want to point out is E.C. Molander III, like a lot of wealthy businessmen, was known to have affairs on his wife. and was also known to have a temper of his own. That's another thing I heard, that he had a temper of his own towards his wife, even. And that's another reason why she wanted to leave him. It wasn't simply just all the money problems that they were going through. I mean, married couples go through money problems all the time. So it wasn't necessarily just that. But as true crime listeners go, we often know that there is a high probability rate that the spouse has something to do with the murder. And even if it doesn't, we all know as people that study true crime that that is more than likely going to be the first person that they look at in the murder. Am I right or wrong? I mean, am I right or wrong? How many times do we hear that? Well, what was the spouse like? Were they fighting? What's going on? Were they active in the community? Did they go to church? Did they do stuff around the community? What were the kids like? How was the kids and the parents' uh, family incorporated like? These are things that you look at as an investigator. 
So all of that was looked at. But out of all of the examples for the story that I got about the murders, when I started asking around, you know, just to the random people, hey, well, have you heard about the, the Crossbell Ranch murders? What do you think about it? As a person that grew up in this community, what could you tell me about it? That's basically how I would ask people. And I heard a lot of different things. I heard about the mafia thing. I heard about everything that I presented in an episode of research material. But that last thing I was told, that was the most plausible thing to me because it just makes complete sense when you think about it. I mean, what better person can you have do it than the one person that E.C. Mulder III might have been suspicious of, but naturally wouldn't suspect would want to kill him? What better person to hire to do that than that person? You get what I'm saying? So to me, I honestly could say that's what I feel like would be the most plausible answer. And with all that said, I got family that grew up around this area, all around there. In fact, in fact, an interesting story for my listeners. When I was a little kid, my grandpa Sarge, would uh, he lived up in Hula, in the Hula Lake area. In fact, he lived up in Bowering, in Whipperwell area. And I spent a lot of my childhood summers off and on up there. And I remember when I was little, one of the things he would do was to take us. And there was a sign. And it had cross, it had cross bell, the logo on it. It was white and red. I think it was faded back then, though. I don't know if it's painted. I haven't been up there in years. Um, but we used to pick grasshoppers. And then we would put them in jars. And then he would take his fishing down there at the lake, down at Gila Lake. And when we were little kids, so... Uh, I would guess in a way that was another reason why I wanted to do this episode because I have a connection to it in a way. I mean, not a connection directly to the murder, not a connection directly to the people, but a connection to the, to the area. Do you get what I'm saying? Um, I spent a good portion of my childhood up off and on all around the Gila Lake area. In fact, I still love it to this day. I need to get up there. I need to take my kid up there. Actually, that's either here nor there. But like I said, looking at this case, I honestly think that that last one is the most plausible, that she hired Chubb Anderson to do it, and they were going to get proceeds that she was a cut from the insurance policy after everything was said and done. I just find that most likely the scenario. I mean, I think anybody that would look into this case would probably feel the same way. And I don't know what they have per se, but I think majority of people would probably feel that would be the most plausible. At least nowadays, that'd be the most plausible. And I think even back then, it'd be the most plausible. I don't think I don't think there was a mafia debt, and I'm going to tell you why. I am familiar with the fact that the Dixie, that the Dixie Mafia out of Louisiana had a lot of business back and forth to the state of Oklahoma. I'm also familiar with the fact that the actual Irish Mafia out of Boston had connections to the Tulsa, Oklahoma area and connections to the Osage, Washington County area, basically all throughout this area. I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of that. I just don't buy that theory. At all. And I'm going to tell you why I don't buy that theory. The reason why I don't buy that theory per se is simply because E.C. Molander III was known to be so wealthy. Yes, he had a bad reputation in a way. And yes, the ranch was going downhill. But I also feel like he would rely on this, the county system. He would rely on the local banks that's in his pocket. He would rely on the local prosecutors. He would he would rely on the people, the goody, the good old boy network. Let's say that. I think that's what he would rely on before he went to the mafia side of it. So I feel like ultimately what happened is just what I stated. I think looking into this case, what I quickly found out is I think the most plausible thing is the wife wanting a divorce with the kids up there said, got to hold the chub. And said, hey, if you help me do this with your brother-in-law and we get away with it, I'll give you a portion out of the money I receive out of the court proceeds. I find that the most plausible. I, I, I really do. And if I'm wrong, let me know. And if, you're, and if you're somebody that's familiar with this case, as I always say, let me know. You know what I mean? Um, and I will get back to you. I got a lot of things going on right now, but I am going to get back to everybody. Um, Still in the process of moving everything in. So, got a lot of stuff going on. Um, anyways, so I hope you enjoyed this episode on Crossbell Ranch uh, Murders. It's a fascinating story. Um, I'm not sure if there's a movie being made about it. I did hear a rumor that there will be. But I do want to say there is a movie being made about the Osage Murders. Um, 
that Ma that Martin Scorsese is supposed to be directing. And I don't know if they do do a movie, uh, who's going to do it on this one, but I don't know if they are or not. I've heard they are, but I've heard that about a lot of different things, and it don't happen. But I do know that those stage murder ones, that one's going to happen. I do know that one for a fact. So, But anyways, this has been Mike for Working Class Thoughts. This has been the Crossbell Ranch murders um, that happened in the Hula Lake area in the towns of Bowering and Whippewell, Oklahoma. Oh, and by the way, if you ever do go out there, um, understand this. Back when, I, back when I was little up there, you couldn't get cell phone reception. Well, hell, barely anybody has cell phones back then. Kind of think about it. Um, but I've been told locals by locals now, you can't get cell phone reception up there. Um, the TV had like two or three stations you can get. Um, and the radio only received a country station and the oldie stations. I mean, it's the same, like, couple families up there for centuries. The same families. Um, so very, very small community. Very, very, very small community. Um, however, I do encourage it. It's a beautiful lake. If you'd like to bass fish, catfish, um, hike, there's a lot of hiking up there. A lot of camping areas. There's a uh, Gila Lake's actually a decent lake to go to, um, and um, lots of things to do on it. I mean, you could do. I mean, it's a lake, you know. But anyways, this has been Mike for Working Class Thoughts. I hope you enjoyed this episode on Crossbell Ranch Murders. Um, and look forward to the next episode. It's actually coming much sooner than what you actually think. So this has been Mike for Working Class Thoughts. I hope you enjoy. Everybody. Go read that book, Footprints in the Do. It's definitely worth it, all right? This has been Michael Work Class Thoughts. Everybody have a great day. Peace, love, and good vibes, all right? All right, bye.